this thing on? Yeah, I think it's on. <clears throat> A few more people coming in. That's good. But we'll go ahead and get started. Um, Y'all are going to have to pardon me tonight because I am kind of a walking zombie. Um, I've been starting work at 6 o'clock in the morning this week and working till 9 o'clock is an early night. 10 is usually about normal. Tonight, uh, I'm on vacation. I got off at 5.30. <laughs> so, um, but it's been fun. Um, I'm going to be glad when my lead mechanic gets back and I can go back to maybe working my usual 12 hour days and then I'll get some rest. Um, <clears throat> thinking about what I wanted to do with the class tonight, I've been working on an answer. Many of you know that when I was in Hawaii I went to visit the uh, Polynesian Cultural Center which is run by Brigham Young University campus there on Oahu and uh, had some interesting discussions with some of the Mormon missionaries there and one of them has been emailing me since we got back and so I have been composing a response and I thought that uh, perhaps it would be good to share it with y'all and get your feedback on it and maybe I can improve it a little bit before I uh, send it to her but uh, when, you, when a Mormon comes to you, what do they tell you to do about the Book of Mormon? You ask them, how do I know the Book of Mormon is true? And what do they tell you to do about that? Okay. That's it. Now when they start quoting scripture, I can almost guarantee you every time it's going to be the Book of Mormon. Some part of that. They rarely will ever quote from the Bible because they don't know it. Um, and so the question that I have always asked them, and it comes from uh, 1 John chapter 4, uh, we're plainly told that there are many lying spirits that are gone out into the world. The fourth chapter of 1 John talks about that. And... Uh, just turn over there real quick and I can't remember the exact verses I was looking at but uh, well verses 1 through uh, 3 are good somebody read that for us You know, the operative thing here is that there are many false spirits that have gone out in the world. So, how do we know the spirit that answers us is the Holy Spirit and not a false spirit? And what answer do they usually give to that? Has anybody, has anybody had many discussions with them? The ones I've discussed it with will just say, I know. Now, what kind of reasoning is that? Subjective or objective? <laughs> it's subjective. All right, objective reasoning is something that we say, this is a pew. And I know this pew is here because I can feel it. I can see it. If I bite it, I can taste the varnish. You know, I can, I can uh, perhaps smell it if we're vacuuming it or something, you know, and the dust comes up from it. I can sense it with my five senses here. There's something to this that's concrete. That's objective reasoning. This is a pew. Okay? When we look at evidence for the Bible, do we have objective evidence or only subjective evidence for the truth of the Word of God? For the truth of the Bible? Because they'll say the Book of Mormon is the Word of God. Alright, you do. You have archaeological evidence that shows... Many of the places, you know, one thing I remember 
that the skeptics used to rail at was when Jesus, or when the Old Testament said that David took the city of the Jebusites by entering into the tunnel at the base of the mountain and going up the water course into the city, they said, ah, oh, that's, you know, the Bible's false. We know that wall was down below there. David couldn't have gone in that way to take the city. Well, then later archaeological digging came up and found out the wall that they thought dated back to the time of the Jebusites was actually a wall that David had constructed after he became king. The wall of the Jebusites was up much higher up the mountain. And so indeed the Bible story was true. And we find all kinds of objective evidence like that for the Bible. Go ahead, Don. can't do that, right. But, but there's a lot of objective evidence yes, that leads you to believe that you can believe that. Yes, right. Okay. Getting back to my notes here, I kind of worked away from there a little bit. But that's, those two kinds of reasoning are important to keep in mind. When you're talking to anybody, when you're talking to Pentecostals and Charismatics, oh, I wouldn't trade what I feel in my heart for what's on a whole stack of Bibles. That's subjective reasoning. Same kind of thing. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 13. And by the way, when you're talking to Mormons, I would just suggest that you use the King James Bible. And the reason for that is because they're King James only people. Um, anyway, they are. I have a lot to say about King James only people. But uh, um, 2 Corinthians 11 verses 13 and 14 says what? Okay. So these false apostles, these lying spirits, these even Satan himself comes in in a glorious fashion as if he is in effect the son of God. That angel of light would give the appearance of one who is the son of God. And so he can show himself off to be that. So how do we know that the, this spirit that answers our prayer about the Book of Mormon is the Holy Spirit? Or is it a lying spirit? If Satan can look at like an angel of light, how can we know? So what I want to do is examine some words that we know are the words of the Holy Spirit. And now let me say this. Let me give this caveat on this. When you start out with this, they're going to tell you that we believe in the Bible insofar as it has not been corrupted by man. And I never can pin them down on where it's been corrupted. I always ask, well, where's it corrupted? Show me where it was corrupted. Give me the scriptures that are corrupted. They can't do it. But, of course, obviously anything that contradicts with what the contradictory Book of Mormon says is corrupted. Um, but uh, going back to the Old Testament times, and some people say, oh, there's no value in studying the Old Testament. Well, here's one value in studying the Old Testament. The various covenants in the Old Testament, and I don't like to call it the Old Testament. It was not a testament. Nobody died to put it in force, therefore it was not a testament. But that's the common name for it. Now the New is a testament because Jesus Christ died to put it in force. So, you know, if you want to get specific about words, which I'm a nitpicker. Uh, but throughout the Old Testament, there were various covenants made with the different patriarchs, with Moses and with the Israelites. And each and every case, there was always an indication. Sometimes it was very subtle. 
sometimes it was very blunt, that this covenant that's being made at this time is going to be superseded by something better. And we'll go back and we'll look at some of these cases. And they're always made as if God made them with these people, but God did not consider them to be a permanent covenant. And that's stated. In the very beginning, in Genesis chapter 3, in verse 15, God made his covenant with Adam and Eve upon casting them out of the Garden of Eden. And in that covenant, there was a promise made. And what was that promise in verse 15? Whoever gets there first. Okay. And so here was a promise made that, yeah, I've got a covenant with you, but there's going to come one who is going to deal the death blow to Satan, the serpent. And that's what a head wound is. It's like a, it's a death blow. And so here we have that. Now, who was that? Well, we don't know yet. But there was something better that was going to come sometime down the pike. Uh, then in Genesis chapter 9, verses 8 and 9, when Noah had been delivered alive with his family from the ark, God made a covenant with Noah. Genesis 9, verses 8 and 9. Whoever gets there first. Not Don every time. Somebody else reads. <laughs> then God spoke to Noah and to his son with his saying, As for me, behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you. Okay, so here's the covenant that's been established with them and with Noah's sons after him. But now when we look down to verse 26 of Genesis chapter 9, what do we read there? Alright, now that's not blunt, it's very subtle, but it gives a hint that something different than this covenant that God made with Noah and his children is going to come down the road somewhere. There is, like I say, sometimes it's a very subtle hint, sometimes it's pretty blunt. And here's one of those times where it's very subtle. Uh, God then in, in Genesis chapter 12 and verses 1 through 3 makes a covenant with, with Abraham. But in this covenant itself, here again, there was an idea that this covenant that he made with Abraham was kind of like a stepping stone to something better. Read that, whoever gets there first. Genesis 12, 1 through 3. Okay, Noah, uh, he said, oh, excuse me, God said to Abraham, or Abram at this time, I'm making a covenant with you. But then he says, who is going to be included in this promise that he's making it, it eventually? All the nations of the earth. Hmm. Gentiles are going to be included in this too? That doesn't make sense, does it? Go ahead, Don. There were no Jews. <laughs> okay. Then in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 15 through 22, God gives his law through Moses to the Israelite nation, his mighty prophet. And Moses, very plainly, he gives this law and he says, Do not violate this law, do not change it in any way, or you will be cursed by God if you do. You keep this law perfectly. But then in this statement, he tells us that there's going to come another prophet. Now, many prophets came after Moses. Were some of them... Lying prophets? Yeah. 
Some of them were. Were some of them true prophets? Well, how do we know the difference? Let's read Deuteronomy 18, verses 15 through 22. Okay. And so here, the test for a false prophet was what? Okay. Now, you bring this up to a Mormon, and then you bring up that Joseph Smith prophesied that there would be a temple built in Nauvoo. Where was Nauvoo? What state? In Michigan? Nauvoo, anyway, let's just say Nauvoo and we'll leave it alone. That was where he got his start. No. No, Utah came later. They left Nauvoo and went to Utah when they were kicked out of Nauvoo. Um, but anyway, in Nauvoo, he said there would be a temple built in his lifetime. And this temple would be great and mighty, and he described it. Guess what? Never done. Hadn't been built to this day. And the Mormons will answer you, well, it, it could be built. No, wait a minute. He said it would happen in his lifetime. Well, Jesus made prophecies that, weren't, that didn't come true, and they gave me one, and I said, well, you've taken that completely out of context. And they do that a lot with the Bible. They take it out of context, so watch for that. But anyway, every other prophet, and we're going to go to two examples, that spoke after Moses also gave signs that what Moses had said about another prophet coming was true. Every other prophet that spoke gave some indication that there was coming this other prophet. Some called him a day star, some called him Messiah. Uh, he was called by various names, Emmanuel. Um, and we're going to read that one and uh, a few others. Um, Daniel in the second chapter of his book tells us pretty plainly when this was going to happen. And he also gives us the strong impression here that what this prophet would teach would be the final authority of God's Word. Turn to Daniel chapter 2 and let's read verses 44 and 45. Daniel 2, 44 and 45. Now this is the tail end of his explanation of the, of the vision that Nebuchadnezzar had. Okay. He says this interpretation is sure. It's absolute. It's true. And when, is, when are those days that it would come? Well, he explains about the four kingdoms. And we had the Babylonian Empire that fell away. We had the Medo-Persian Empire. We had the Greco-Roman or, or Greek Empire and then the Roman Empire. And it was in the days of the fourth empire, the Roman Empire, that this Messiah was to come and that this kingdom was to be established and that it would, it would consume the whole earth or it would fill the whole earth 
And it would break down all these other kingdoms and it was going to last forever. Now that's an indication that when that kingdom comes, when that word is finally given, that it's going to be the last word of God. Isaiah plainly tells us when this Messiah would come in Isaiah 56 and verse 8. Isaiah 56 and verse 8, and he is quoted in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 23. Um, and he said that the Gentiles would be brought into the kingdom of God and that the Jews would no longer be the exclusive people of God, but that all nations were going to be brought in. What does that hark back to? God's promise to who? Abraham. Alright, Isaiah 56 and verse 8. Okay, and so here we have this other people being brought into the kingdom. Then in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 23, Messiah came to the earth in the person of Jesus Christ, as was prophesied by Isaiah and recorded by Matthew chapter 1 and verse 23. I didn't put my, um, Isaiah's verse in there for the where Matthew quotes from him, but read Matthew 1 and verse 23. Okay. And so this God man was brought into the world to deliver the last word of the Almighty God once and for all times. And note what Jesus said in the following passages. Look at Luke chapter 21 and verse 33. Hmm. So let's see, that leaves room for another gospel of Jesus Christ. Look at John 12, verses 44 through 50. John 12, 44 through 50. Jesus Christ said, He that believeth on me, believeth not on me, but on him that sent me. And he that seeth me, seeth him that sent me. I have come to light into the world, and whosoever believeth on me does not abide in darkness. And if any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not, for I come not to judge the world, but to save the world. He that rejected me and he receives not my words, hath one that judges him. The word that I have spoken, shall judge in the last day. For I have not spoken of myself, the Father who sent me, he gave me a commandment, what I should say, what I should speak. Know that his commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. Okay. Did Jesus think that what he was speaking to them was going to be the last testament of God Almighty to the world? Kind of sounds that way, doesn't it? Um, and then John, uh, well, let's see, I put John 12 in there twice in my notes. Jesus uh, did believe this, and he, while he was on the earth, gathered 12 men to him and they followed him around all over. And toward the end of Jesus' life on this earth, Jesus gave his holy apostles authority. And he gave them all authority. You know, one scripture I didn't put in here and I was thinking about it and I need to was the scripture that uh, where the Jews were astonished because Jesus taught as one having authority. And I'm just going to put that in my notes here to add into there later. <laughs> but Jesus taught as one who had authority inherent in him. Did Moses teach that way? No. 
Moses taught as one who was given authority by God. He was only teaching what God would let him teach. How about Balaam? When Balaam prophesied, did Balaam prophesy of his own authority? No, he couldn't. God said, you're going to tell... He said, you, finally God said, okay, you can go, but you're only going to speak what I tell you to speak. Now, Balaam acted out of authority from God, you know, outside the authority of God when he brought the Moabites in and, and had the Israelites committing adultery with them. But he could only speak what God allowed him to speak as God's prophet. He didn't have his own authority. But Jesus comes into the world and he teaches as one who has inherent in himself authority. Indicative of the fact that he was God-man. Now Jesus gives this kind of authority to the apostles. Read Matthew chapter 18 and verse 18. Okay. They had the authority to bind on earth and loose on earth the things that had been bound and loosed in heaven. Is the literal meaning of this statement. They had that authority inherent within them that was delivered to them by Jesus Christ. Now turn with me to Matthew chapter 28 verses 18 through 20. Whoever's there first. But you see, the Word of God was corrupted. And it didn't have the ability to save man because the Word of God became corrupted by man. And so until 1840, when the angel Moroni appeared to Joseph Smith in the woods and, told him, and helped him to uh, translate these golden plates, which, what was it, six people said that they saw and three of them later recanted that they had seen the plates. Um, Kind of makes that a little bit <laughs> iffy you know, as to whether any of them were lying or not. But, but let's just say all six of them did see the plates, let's just say. But let's just say that's true. That the angel, an, an angel of God named Moroni, don't read his name anywhere in the Bible, never appeared before, came down and he did give Joseph Smith the correct word of God. Jesus said, Go ye into all the world and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you all way, even in the end of the world. Nobody who followed that was saved until 1840. 1,840 years after Jesus walked this earth when the correct word of God was given to Joseph Smith. Galatians 1, 6 through 12. Go ahead and read down through 12. Which is really not another, nor another
Okay? Jesus very plainly gave his apostles the authority to teach men all truth in his name. And he told them to take that truth to all the world. A double L. What part of all don't you understand? <coughs> These apostles then went to all the world, preached this gospel, and well, the question might be asked by several people, and, and, and I think it's a legitimate question, did the apostles really think that the world was going to last 2,000 years after the birth of Christ? You know, from their writings, I would say uh, that I don't think they, I mean, this is just me thinking, of course, and you know what happens when I start thinking, I start getting in a lot of trouble. <laughs> But it seems to me that they didn't have a concept that the earth was going to last maybe beyond 100 A.D., maybe 200 A.D., something like that. It didn't seem to them, it, from what, the way they wrote, that the earth would last that long. And I think they might be surprised that it lasted this long. But the fact is, however long it lasted, the apostles very obviously thought that what they were teaching was the last word of God and that their word would stand the test of all time to come. So whether the earth lasted another 20 years or another 20,000 years, this is the word. And Jesus gave the same indications when he spoke. He said, my word will judge you in that last day. The apostles gave the same indication. And Paul said, don't go running after another gospel. Because it's not another gospel. Even in the first century, here were people deserting the gospel of Jesus Christ and thinking they had something better. And Paul said, don't do that. That's a lying gospel. Even if an angel from heaven brings it to you, let him be anathema. King James says. And as I said before, I would always use King James when I'm studying with Mormons because they are King James only people. And so let's just let them use the King James. Perfectly good translation. Nothing wrong with it. Um, and the King James proves that what they're teaching is false doctrine. Paul said in Acts chapter 7, did you have something, Don? I'm sorry. Oh, I was just going to bring up that Paul Okay. Did Paul's teachings and doctrine meet the test that Moses set forth to be met by any prophet that would come after him? Turn to Acts chapter 17 verses 10 through 11. Whoever gets there first, read that. This is important because this ties the New Testament to the Old Testament and shows us that what's written in the New Testament is in fact that which Moses said would come. Acts 17 verses 10 through 11. And they received the word with all readiness of mind, and 
search the scriptures did. One of those things is so. Okay, so they went into the book of Galatians and the book of 2 Corinthians and the book of uh, Ephesians and they studied these scriptures to see if what Paul was telling them was so. Is that what that means? What scriptures existed in that day? <laughs> the Old Testament. And they went into the old, the scriptures that they had, the Old Testament, and they searched those scriptures and they said, is what Paul's telling us the truth? And guess what? They found that it was in accordance with everything that Moses and the prophets had said. Now, look at the Book of Mormon. Has anybody read the Book of Mormon? I have. I took the challenge. And I asked and I prayed about it. And guess what? The Holy Spirit did answer me. And I've just read a lot of the Holy Spirit's answer to you right here tonight. We're, we're going to go through some more of it. Um, the scriptures that these brethren searched were the Old Testament scriptures and the New Testament tied right into it. The Apostle John very clearly also thought that his words were the final authority of Christ. And we can go to a lot of different scriptures to show these things. I'm just bringing out some representative ones uh, for the sake of time. But he tells us with no uncertainty that what is found there is the final authority of Christ. And I'm just going to go ahead and read, these, uh, read the rest of this, the rest of these scriptures for you because uh, we're running out of time. Uh, 1 John chapter 3, verses 23 through chapter 4 and verse 6. John says, This is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as he commanded us. The one who keeps his commandments abides in him, and he in him. And we know by this that he abides in us, by the Spirit whom he has given us. He then gives us a charge in chapter 4 to test every spirit who tells us he's speaking in God's name and he tells us how. He says, Beloved, chapter 4 verse 1, do not believe every spirit but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world, by this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist of which you have heard that it is coming and now it is already in the world. You are from God, little children and have overcome them. Because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. They are from the world, therefore they speak as from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God. He who knows God listens to us. He who is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Two things in here. The spirit who claims to be the Spirit of God Himself is going to attest to the fact that Jesus Christ, God, came down to the earth in the form of a man. Secondly, that Spirit, this angel of light, as He appears to us, is also going to listen to, He's going to teach the same things that the apostles taught. And He who does not listen to us, John said, is not of us. He's a lying spirit. So he says that whoever's from God listens to God. Now in um, Galatians 1, John echoes the same idea um, in... Uh, hmm, somehow I didn't put that in the list. Uh, Galatians 1, I believe that's going to be verses... Oh, we already mentioned it. Galatians 1, in verses 8 and 9 really, uh, specifically in there, but in verses 6 through 12, which we already read. Um, apologize, I, I told you beforehand that I'm kind of brain dead tonight. Um, but John echoes the same idea in these words found in 2 John chapter 1. Uh, or actually there is no 2 John chapter 1, it's 2 John 9 through 11. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. Now had the Book of Mormon 
been produced at that time? According to the Mormons, Jesus hadn't even come to South America to appear to the Aztec Indians. By the way, there's not one shred. The Mormons have been down there for years doing archaeological diggings in South America, trying to find some evidence of the Book of Mormon. They have not found one single city mentioned in the Book of Mormon. They have not found one single place that's described there. They have not found any evidence that any of the characters mentioned in the Book of Mormon ever lived and they've not found any evidence that any of the events of the Book of Mormon ever happened. Not one shred of archaeological evidence to support it. Um, Whosoever transgresseth, transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you, and bring not this doctrine, what doctrine? The one that has been taught. Book of Mormon is not included in that because it didn't exist. It can't be included in that. Uh, he said, Receive him not into your house, neither bid him Godspeed, for he that biddeth him Godspeed is a partaker of his evil deeds. John further says, in what is probably the final, the last book to be written of the New Testament, uh, in the first century, that we must reject any doctrines or revelations that come after the New Testament canon is finished. Revelation chapter 22. And uh, verses 12 through 19, really, since we're running out of time, I'm just going to read uh, verses 18 and 19. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the book of prophecy. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things that are written in this book. Now, question tonight. Do you want the blessings that are written in the book of God? Do you think you can find them in another gospel? When Paul very clearly said, or when the apostles very clearly said there wouldn't be another. When Jesus said there wouldn't be another. What's the answer? I read the book of Mormon. I prayed about it. Did the Holy Spirit answer my prayer? I think he did. But he didn't do it through some subjective means of better felt than told or some vision that came down. He answered it through the words that he penned in the first century. And he said, no, the Book of Mormon is not the Word of God. This is information, really, or, or literature that you can use to answer the Mormons you can also use it to answer the charismatics because they say, oh, I'd rather have what I feel in my heart than what's on a whole stack of Bibles. And all kinds of different religions. You can use it with a Baptist who believes in adhering to the Philadelphia Confession of Faith. I remember a, a story, humorous story, uh, about two preachers that were arguing over which was right, you know, which, whose doctrine was right. And the one preacher was a, he, he was a Christian preacher, they called him back then. And they went to an agnostic to settle the question. And the agnostic asked, said, uh, well, Mr. Baptist, uh, he said, uh, what, what is your creed? What do you adhere to? He said, I adhere to the Philadelphia Confession of Faith, written in such and such year and all of this. Okay, well, Mr. Christian, what creed do you adhere to? He said, I adhere to the Bible. The, uh, the holy book of God and the agnostic look and he said well Mr. Christian if you follow your creed it's going to lead you to Christ Mr. Baptist if you follow your creed it's going to lead you to Philadelphia I'm going to quit 